Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our National Mentoring and Youth Serving Organizations call. My name is Jennifer Burgoyne, and I'm a program manager here at Mentor. We appreciate you taking the time to join us today. We think this call will provide you with a lot of great information about what's going on throughout the National Mentoring Movement. For those of you who are new to this gathering, these calls give the field an opportunity to learn updates and innovations from other organizations, peer share resources and practices, and think of new ways to partner and collaborate. You're all such amazing leaders in this field, and we really appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today. Before we get started, I wanted to briefly go over some go-to webinar logistics. You can probably tell all phone lines are currently in listen-only mode, um, which means that the, the phone lines are muted. We found that on larger convenings like this, there's often some unintended feedback from various phone lines. So we find it's just safer to, to have them in, in listen-only mode. That said, we absolutely want this to be a participatory experience. If you have questions or comments or feedback throughout the call, um, there are a couple of ways you can share those. First, you'll see to the left of your control panel, there's a little hand icon. Um, if you click that yellow hand icon, it'll notify me that you'd like to be unmuted, and I can do that. Or if you have questions or thoughts, um, you can just type them into the question box, and I'll, I'm happy to read them off. Okay. So we want to welcome the 48 of you who are on this call today, representing the 40 organizations on this slide. We have people representing various roles, including folks in programming, communications, research, public policy, and a few CEOs. So we think and hope that today's call will provide all of you with information that will help you in, in your roles and throughout your organizations. Today we'll be sharing updates from Mentor about the In Real Life campaign, our new guide to mentoring boys and young men of color, the National Mentoring Program Survey, and some legislative updates. We'll then transition over to Farhat, the Program Director at Peace First, who will discuss how your organization can get involved with the Peace First Challenge. We also have Matt from the Thrive Foundation for Youth joining us today, and he'll be discussing an app to help mentors and disadvantaged youth learn, build, and utilize social capital. So we've got a lot of great information coming today. I'm going to first pass things over to Liz Hardy, our Director of Marketing and Communications. Thanks so much, Jen. And welcome to everyone on this call. I'm sure most of the information I will be presenting you today is not new, as you've heard me speak a lot about the In Real Life campaign and certainly the roles that you all can play here. We did want to give a shortened version of a presentation which was given at an internal development conference recently on the power of movements like the Mentor in Real Life campaign and how they may be beneficial to everyone in this network as well as to Mentor as a whole. Uh, this slide obviously speaks to the overall mission of Mentor, which is ultimately to close the mentoring gap for young people in our country. Uh, one in three people are growing up without a mentor, and the Mentor in Real Life movement was really created as a way for the entire mentoring field and youth-serving organizations field to mobilize behind this shared goal for us all. A quick quote just around what movements are. Movements are around mobilizing people behind a shared purpose. If we all work together to generate ideas that create more involved, more meaningful cultural connections, which drive business and societal decisions that create more involved and meaningful relationships, which feed back into communities and companies, the virtual cycle of interactivity that can leverage a company or organization's position to identify and affect relevant social, environmental, or world change, well, who wouldn't want to be a part of that? This is the power of movements, where they can just start out with a small group of people who believe passionately in something and can end up changing the culture around the world. 
I wanted to show you all a quick three-minute video on how to start a movement, uh, but Jen <laughs> would not allow me to show a video on this call. I certainly will send you all out the link and encourage you to watch it. It's very amusing. And the takeaway here is that leaders really are not the ones who create movements. It really is that first few followers and then the followers after that who end up creating and solidifying the movement. And really, that's just uh, the start of us talking. You know, we may have created the Mentor in Real Life movement campaign as a way of advancing the mission to close the mentoring gap, but you are, all are the ones who can help us make it, make it into a real movement. Here I just want to talk about five takeaways that successful social movement campaigns all share. The first is relevancy, and here you really want to consider how your campaign fits into what's resonating both on social media, in current events, and obviously with your target audience, and definitely want to consider appealing to people's emotions here. Second is credibility. Obviously, people like celebrities can add credibility to a campaign, but also everyday advocates add, add credibility to a cam campaign as well. A call to action, your, call to a your campaign's call to action should be very clear about what you want the person to do. And obviously, for Mentor in Real Life ca campaign, the call to action is to become a mentor. Simplicity, uh, you, your campaign should revolve just around one simple uniting voice, and especially if it includes a hashtag, using just one hashtag. Here, obviously, this is mentor, hashtag mentor IRL. And the last is urgency. Really keeping, uh, keeping your deadlines, goals, and making updates to the campaign often to create urgency and really inspire people to act on the spot. This is just a few examples of each one of these takeaways from really other successful social movement campaigns. So how, does, how do these movement goals for in real life fit in? Obviously, we want to drive awareness, particularly around our target audience of millennials, of this real urgent need to close the mentoring gap. We also want Mentor in Real Life to spark a conversation using compelling stories about both high-profile mentors and also everyday mentor mentees. Mentor in Real Life encourages others, as well as yourself, to share stories about either mentors in their own life or their own mentoring stories using the hashtag MentorIRL. We want to also help people learn more about the opportunities to mentor in their own communities, raise funds for organizations, both ours, yours, and your local affiliates that may provide mentoring programs, and also to call for general federal and state public policy that supports mentoring initiatives. So where are we right now with the In Real Life campaign? Um, obviously using these five takeaway tactics, the campaign has been steadily gaining momentum since its launch in January. Just a few updated facts for you. Since the launch of the campaign and seeing our big activation with the president and Steph Curry video, we've seen about 55,000 searches to become a mentor in the Mentoring Connector since January, where previously we only saw about 4,000 searches per month. Some early, other early successes in other metrics around the hashtag mentor IRL, we've seen a billion impressions of over 20,000 tweets from over 8,000 individual contributors. Some higher profile people who have used the hashtag are the NBA, the White House, the Golden State Warriors, and recording artist Janelle Monet. We've seen media coverage from everyone, including Associated Press to Bloomberg, Huffington Post, and many sports outlets around our In Real Life videos. And certainly, again, as we said, um, the Mentoring Connector searches are way up. 
quickly just says about how followers create movements. We really want to talk about what value you as national or organizations are to us in the movement. You share our vision and mindset around mentoring. You give us trust and credibility. You're able to balance both national and local interests and perspectives. And you really are our boots on the ground to activate those real life stories. I really would love for uh, Rochelle from Spark, to, uh, who has been a great partner in, in real life to us so far. I hope that you've all seen some of the, their blog posts, as well as some of the great assets they've contributed to us, especially in July. And um, they have been involved in the movement since January. So um, Rochelle, would you please take the floor for a few minutes and just talk about some of the ways Spark has been involved? Sure. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rochelle Daminger, and I'm the Director of Communications for SPARC. We're a national nonprofit youth mentoring organization serving students in the middle grades. And um, as Liz shared, we've been participating in the uh, In Real Life campaign since January. And this is an important piece of our external relations work for a couple of reasons. The first couple of reasons center around content. Um, first of all, the In Real Life campaign is simple. It's easy to use. The content can be customized. And it's helped us um, to share our story online and to build our network with other like-minded organizations, partners, and funders. In Real Life also gives us access to content that we would normally not have. So um, we don't have a relationship with the White, <laughs> with the White House. but through some of our relationships with mentor and similar organizations in this campaign, we've been able to share really great content. Um, in fact, the, the video with President Obama and Steph Curry um, gave us some of our highest engagement in social media ever. And again, we just wouldn't have this content without this type of campaign. Um, it's also year-round content. So Spark has several campaigns that we participate in periodically throughout the year. For example, September is Attendance Awareness Month, so we'll generate um, some content and communications activities around that, which is a nice touch point. But it's really great to have a common thread that we can use in all of our communications year round. That type of communication helps us to develop a consistency that we might not have um, without the In Real Life campaign. Uh, in Real Life helps us to create cohesion between and among our communication mediums, whether it's social media handles, blog posts, or email communication, and also um, consistency across our regions. So we're set up as a national organization with regional outposts that have their own social media handles and communication. So even though we all may be engaged in different elements of our program, In Real Life is one common theme in our communication. Um, but honestly, the, the biggest reason that In Real Life has been great for us is it's the national framework that we need to tell our story. Like many other mentoring organizations, I'm sure, on this call, Spark strives to be a best-in-class um, nonprofit mentoring organization, but we know that we alone can't fill the mentoring gap. The In Real Life campaign sets the national stage for mentoring, and it's important for Spark to be a part of that, to be a player in helping the movement grow. And as we participate, we demonstrate that value back to our partners. So in this way, we're extending our reach and growing our network, but we're also connecting our partners, whether it's funders or whether it's um, corporations or um, mentor sources, connecting them with the national mentoring movement. And we've learned um, anecdotally that mentors might volunteer and feel that they're doing something really great, but not understand the urgency around the mentoring gap through um, the In Real Life campaign, through the story sharing, and lots of the other content, we're beginning to communicate this urgency and help our partners and our volunteers to feel more connected to the national movement. Thank you so much. That was such a great example. And certainly, um, thank you for all of the content. And I don't want to go without saying that there's so many other partners who have been able to leverage in real life as well on this call. Um, we certainly are not overlooking you as well. Our last slide is just really talking about how in real life is a public, really public movement that Mentor is not trying to own and really want to show how much it, it might add value to you and your organization. 
So in real life can tie your organization, as Rochelle had noted, to this bigger picture and national issue. It can also provide some credibility through things like the celebrity partnerships we've we've done as well as digital and design assets we're able to distribute. It elevates the local stories that you have and increases visibility on our platform. It provides a platform to collect just the whole picture of men the mentoring gap issue versus just a localized picture. It offers recognition for both key, key state stakeholders in the mentoring mo movement as well as key stakeholders potentially in your own organization. And it also really just increases the number of activations, in our case, driving more individuals to become mentors in the communities across the country. Thanks everyone for such great partnership on In Real Life and please contact me if there is any questions that you have on ways you might be able to get involved. Thank you Liz. So I wanted to take just a brief moment to see if there are any questions at this point. Um, remember you can click that little hand icon or um, you can write your question or comment in the questions box. Um, we have gotten one for Liz. Someone said, are there any in real life videos or activations that we can expect in the near future? We're happy to retweet with the hashtag MentorIRL. Sure. I would say that the next big, um, the big event, as Rochelle had also mentioned for Mentor, will be during Attendance Awareness Month, where we will have uh, in real life and Attendance Awareness co-branded materials and toolkit available for partners to use. We do have, I think, a couple of other videos slated to be released this year. Um, although there's nothing public that I can release about those videos yet. It's intriguing. Um, okay, well, I think that's all the questions we have right now, but uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to either send them to me and I can pass them along to Liz or, or send them to Liz directly. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass things on to our next speaker, Elizabeth Santiago, our Senior Director of Programs. Hi everyone, it's good to be here today and, and happy to talk to you about a, a new product that we have, among some other things around uh, mentoring boys and young men of color. So first and foremost, I wanted to make you aware of a series of resources that we developed um, and partnered with um, My Brother's Keeper Alliance to develop. So I now announced months ago on a previous call that Mentor uh, had partnered with MBK to develop these tools and now we am happy to report that we're done with most of the tools and they're available to you. Um, first we developed some virtual trainings that provide a foundation for looking at race, privilege, social capital, and racial identity as they relate to the mentoring relationship. We also hosted and facilitated four webinars connecting research to practice in this area. And again, all of these webinars and trainings are available for you to review and use now um, on our mentoring.org website under program resources. Um, next slide, please. So along with the webinars and virtual trainings, we're excited to announce the release of the Guide to Mentoring Boys and Young Men of Color. It's a companion guide to the uh, elements of effective practice for mentoring that focuses on the nuances and particulars of mentoring boys and young men of color. The guide describes building the cultural competency of the mentor through intentional training using a critical mentoring lens with mentees, which means focusing on building a mentee's critical consciousness in order for them to better understand their role in society and the power they have to make change. Um, and we discuss approaching mentees from a strength-based perspective uh, versus simply focusing on negative aspects of their situation. So the guide is available for download and we welcome feedback, dialogue, uh, ideas for future iterations and any other thoughts that you'd like to share. Uh, we're, we're happy to entertain those and look forward to collaborating more fully on future products in this area. And again, you can access this uh, by going to mentoring.org um, and looking under program resources. My contact information is also on the slide, so if you'd like to reach out to me with any other ideas, please please feel free to, free to do so. Um, so that was my announcement, and I'm going to turn it over to Mike Garinger now, our Director of Knowledge Management. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just wanted to give folks a quick update about 
uh, where things are at with our big national mentoring program survey. Um, as you may recall, this uh, launched back in the spring. Um, and, and to date, we've already got uh, about 900 completed surveys in the system um, from 900 individual uh, agencies, organizations around the country. Um, in the survey, you can report on what, more than one program that you uh, may operate at a time. And so the total number of programs is, is up over 1,000, I believe. So thank you to everybody on this call who has either filled it out themselves or has encouraged their affiliates um, to fill it out uh, directly. Um, and I think we're going to do one last big push over the next few months. The survey is open through mid-September. Uh, to allow you know school-based programs that are kind of just now coming back from a well-deserved break, give them an opportunity to to report on um, what their programs look like and the numbers of youth they've served um, in the past year. Uh, you can see here on the slide there are a number of states that we are kind of uh, wanting, especially to boost our our response rates from. Um, you know, some of these are are rural states. Um, some are, are heavily populated, um, but you know, if, if we throw out California and New York, two obviously very populated states, but states that we just started doing some outreach in through our mentoring partnerships in, in those locations, um, the rest of these states have combined to only send in about 50 survey responses. So we really are looking for um, a, a dramatic boost um, in these states. Um, so if you have affiliates that are operating in these states um, or just affiliates in general that you think perhaps uh, may not have filled out the survey, we'd sure appreciate you all sending out a <clears throat> another reminder uh, to them. You can find information about the survey on the Mentor website. Uh, just visit the website and you'll see a little pop-up uh, footer along the bottom of the screen that, that'll take you right to the national survey. Uh, we can also provide you with email language and, and templates and things like that if you just want a, a quick and easy way to, to let your affiliates know that uh, the survey is still open. And in most states, um, <clears throat> they can still be eligible for a cash prize that we're making available um, for, for programs that have filled out uh, the survey. We'll be doing a drawing in, in each state um, and picking two winners. So uh, another incentive for them to, to do that. So, um, you know, and those of you that run large national um, projects, if you are ever interested in a snapshot of what your own affiliates reported as part of this, we can break that out and provide you with a, a little bit of a snapshot of what your own organization said as well, if that's another motivating factor for you. So uh, my email is up here on the screen. Um, if anyone has questions, feel free to contact me, and I'm happy to, to help uh, spread the word about this to your organizations um, in any way that I can. So thanks. Thank you, Mike. All right, next. I'm going to pass things over to Abby Evans, our Director of Government Relations. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I have just a few quick things I wanted to go over with you. Um, for those of you who join this call regularly, none of these will be a surprise. Um, uh, as you know, um, Mentor has two major legislative priorities as well as uh, some other uh, bills and issues that we'd like to keep an eye on. Uh, the Child Protection Improvements Act, and certainly uh, the Youth Mentoring Grant uh, that is managed uh, by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention at the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, I'm going to give you guys a quick funding update in a second, and then an update, an exciting update, actually, on the Child Protection Improvements Act. But I just want to take one second to remind all of you, um, either those of you who are local here in the greater D.C. area or those of you who are coming or know that you have affiliates who are attending the National Mentoring Summit, um, to when our registration opens at the end of the month, I hope you encourage them all to participate in Capitol Hill Day. It's a really phenomenal opportunity to make sure that not only your programs, but uh, experts and passionate advocates who are um, really care a lot about young people and specifically about the benefits of mentoring to get on the Hill to make sure that legislators of all stripes and colors know uh, what these issues are, uh, why they should care about them, and what's happening in their community. So definitely encourage you guys uh, to consider participating, and you're welcome to reach out to me to learn more about Capitol Hill Day at any time. 
so on to the update on the youth mentoring funding. Oh, actually, if you could hang on and go back just one second, Jen. Sorry about that. I know I'm jumping around on my bullets. That's my my uh, my fault. Um, the, uh, as many of you know, the federal fiscal year starts on October 1st, uh, which means that when Congress returns from their summer recess in uh, right after Labor Day, they have about four weeks to make sure that all of the funding bills uh, that it covers the entire federal budget um, are taken care of. Um, and since none of them have passed, <laughs> um, that uh, what they will most likely have to do is pass some sort of stopgap funding bill. It's usually called a continuing resolution. Um, most likely, what they will do is pass a continuing resolution that will fund the government through probably mid-December, um, and then before they they adjourn for the calendar year and the end of this current Congress, uh, they'll either pass another short-term uh, funding gap or pass a year-long uh, omnibus spending bill. Um, so. Uh, but much more immediately, when they come back uh, after Labor Day and they start working on this continuing resolution, one of the funding programs that will be affected, obviously, is the OGJDP Youth Mentoring uh, Grant. Um, and just a quick reminder, um, both the House and the Senate Appropriations Committees, the funding committees responsible for uh, uh, federal funding, have both passed their bill that, um, uh, that funds the Department of Justice. The House uh, Appropriations Bill approved 90, that's nine zero million dollars for the grant, which is level funding. That's the current level of funding for the grant. The Senate, however, passed only 75, that's seven five million dollars. Uh, so naturally, uh, mentor and many of our advocates and many current and past grantees of this exciting grant uh, really want to see the highest level of funding possible pass. So. Uh, one of the things Mentor will be organizing here in just a few short days or weeks is a coalition letter to congressional leaders calling on them to approve the House uh, passed bill, the, uh, sorry, the pa uh, House committee passed uh, level of $90 million. Um, so I'll be reaching out to many of your organizations uh, asking for your uh, organizations to sign on to that letter. Um, and we will. Uh, we also have um, uh, had some interest from legislators on the Hill to circulate what they call a dear colleague letter. It's basically like the same idea of a coalition letter, but it's members of Congress who sign the letter to their own leadership, um, and they have uh, offered to circulate a letter asking uh, congressional leaders to support the House the House pass number, which is uh, the 90 million level, which is really exciting. So. Stay tuned, you'll hear from me soon. I hope you guys consider signing on because obviously the, the more signatures we get, the bigger impact we make. Uh, but you're certainly welcome to reach out with me out to me with um, any questions about that. Um, so on to the Child Protection Improvements Act update. Um, you've heard me talk about this a lot, but really quickly for those of you who may not know what CPIA is, um, it's in short, its goal is to make sure that access to FBI fingerprint background checks is universally available, which means any youth serving organization or any er organization serving vulnerable populations has access to FBI fingerprint background checks uh, to screen their staff and volunteers if they want to. Uh, only about half of states make that access available to youth serving organizations. Um, and, and CPIA would close that gap and make sure that all organizations who want access will have them. Um, this is a bill that we care strongly about and we've been fighting for more than a decade to see moved. Um, and we've gotten some really exciting and promising news from the House uh, just this week. In fact, we were on the Hill yesterday talking to our House sponsors, Mr. Bishop and Mr. Schiff, um, who have been working with the House Judiciary Committee staff to um, uh, update the bill in a way that, that reads a little bit more streamlined, uh, which means that the committee is now a little more interested, uh, I should say, a lot more interested in moving the bill when they return in September. So it's entirely possible we'll see the House Judiciary Committee vote on this bill in September. Um, and we have been told pretty plainly that they would not advance the bill out of committee if they didn't expect the full House to get an opportunity to vote on it possibly as early as September, but most certainly before the end of the calendar year. That's awesome news um, and something I uh, hope that excites all of you who have endorsed this bill. 
Um, and I encourage you to reach out to anyone on the House Judiciary Committee to say, yay, please vote yes on CPIA. But the one thing, if there's only one thing you can do to help us out, I'm going to ask you actually to turn your attention to the U.S. Senate. Um, the slide that Jen has uh, up for you right now uh, shows you all of the members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, that is the Committee of Jurisdiction in the Senate for CPIA. The legislators listed in red already endorsed CPIA. The rest of them have not yet endorsed it. We've had great conversations and heard great things from most of those offices. None of them have been willing to put their name as a co put down their name as a co-sponsor of that bill. And with the House possibly moving as early as next month, we really need the Senate to be geared up and ready to accept the House passed bill and take action before the end of the calendar year. So uh, I would ask you to, if you can only do one thing, to please reach out to your U.S. Senators, especially if they sit on this committee, but you can reach out to any of your Senators um, and ask them to co-sponsor the Child Protection Improvements Act. And just a quick reminder that Senator Schumer from New York and Senator Hatch from Utah are our Senate sponsors. And Senator Bishop, I'm sorry, Representative Bishop from Michigan and Representative Schiff from California are our House sponsors. All of them have been really great advocates for this bill, and uh, we want to see it pass finally. It's past time for CPIA to get across that finish line, and with all of your help, I know we can make it happen. So uh, please let me know if you have any questions, and thanks in advance for all of your help and your support. Thanks very much, Abby. I see we've got a question coming in, but I'm just going to give this one more brief update, and then we'll do a fuller Q&A before we move on to our guest speakers. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to talk about the updated Mentoring Connector Toolkit. Many of you are very familiar with the Mentoring Connector. It's our national database of mentoring programs and a free volunteer referral service for programs. Uh, folks looking to mentor can search their zip code, find programs in their area, and inquire to become a mentor through the system. The Mentoring Connector is connected to several of our partners' websites, including LinkedIn, Serve.gov, NBA Cares, um, and so many other avenues of free program advertisement. Um, it, the Mentoring Connector launched a year ago in August 2015, and since then, uh, 14,000 people have reached out to become a mentor through the Mentoring Connector. There's been nearly 100,000 searches, so it's, um, it's, a, it's a great benefit for your programs who are looking to recruit volunteer mentors. And we recently updated the Mentoring Connector Toolkit so that mentoring partnerships and national organizations can easily share information about the Mentoring Connector if you'd like. Um, so you can see here we've developed language for different types of social media, newsletters, and we created this fun new Mentoring Connector graphic for Instagram or other types of social media. So we're hoping to make sharing this free resource as easy as possible for you. Um, so I, I'll send these slides as a follow-up. Um, and. I will include the Mentoring Connector Toolkit as well, as well as some of the websites and links that Liz Hardy spoke about with the, the movement. All right, so if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to click that hand icon or type them into the chat box. Um, Abby, we've got a question for you. Um, are there any concerns that people should be aware of before approaching those senators that you listed on, on the slide? Any special considerations to keep in mind? Um, in terms of special considerations, I would say it's good to keep in mind that CPIA carries no taxpayer expense. Um, the fees associated with performing the background check actually cover the total cost. Um, so no, uh, there it's uh, what they say here in D.C., it's budget neutral. Uh, it's already bipartisan, and it's not a mandate. So even if CPIA becomes a law tomorrow, no organization would be required to utilize FBI fingerprint background checks. Um, they would just have the option if they wanted to. Uh, occasionally, we hear concerns from uh, members who are worried about privacy, um, and certainly that's an issue we worry about as well. I think the um, the good news is that 
um, the underlying bill and this kind of refreshed bill that the House is working on really ensure in black and white, right in the text, that anyone who has who wants to challenge their record has uh, the information necessary to do so. Um, and we're actually having a very detailed conversation with the House Judiciary Committee about making sure that nothing, uh, nothing too private, nothing uh, concerning, is actually passed on when an organization requests a background check. So uh, it, I think privacy is probably the issue we hear about most, and I really feel like we're doing our level best to make sure that's addressed. Thanks, Abby. And then there's one more question for you. Can you talk at all about the reasons or what's preventing the Senate from not signing on? Um, the nice answer is apathy. I think it's just uh, a bill that um, everyone agrees should happen um, and just haven't bothered to get getting around to taking care of yet. Um, in fact, you know, I told you guys that uh, Senator Schumer and Senator Hatch are strong, uh, are our sponsors and, and strong advocates for the bill. Uh, but in the last few weeks, we've actually seen a lot of movement uh, in the Senate on CPIA uh, because a co-sponsor of the bill, Senator Franken from Minnesota, is just baffled why Congress hasn't already taken care of this issue. Um, so he's really just been and reaching out to the sponsors and saying, what can I do to help? We, we really need to take care of this. Thank you, Abby, and I love that little chuckle when I asked the, <laughs> that question. <laughs> all right, so I think that it looks like those are all the questions for now. So I'm going to transition over to our first speaker. Hold on one moment while I pull up the slide. All right, um, so Farhat is the program director at Peace First. As a program director, Farhat supports the continued design, delivery, and expansion of Peace First initiatives including the Peace First Prize and the Peace First Challenge, which is what we're, we'll be talking about today. In this role, she also works to build strong partnerships with critical aligned networks in the field to expand Peace First influence, reach, and impact. Prior to joining Peace First, Farhat developed program strategy for the Rockefeller Foundation's Energy and Health Initiatives, worked to scale education and employment programs for at-risk youth with YouthBuild International, I think YouthBuild's on the call today, and served as Peace Corps volunteer in Costa Rica. Farhat has a Master's in Sustainable International Development from Brandeis University and an undergraduate degree in International Affairs from the University of Mary Washington. Um, and Farhad, I'll let you take it away. I think uh, I think this will really be of interest to a lot of folks on on the call. So I'm excited for everyone to hear more about this challenge. Hi, Jen, and and everyone on the call. Thanks so much for inviting Peace First to join and that very kind introduction. Um, so Peace First is an organization that teaches young people peace building skills, empowers them to take on social injustices in their community through peacemaking projects and invests in their idea through a million dollar venture fund. And it's really our fundamental belief that any injustice can and should be tackled through a peacemaking framework that uses compassion, courage, and collaboration. So on this uh, webinar, I'll really share a little bit more about our new uh, program called the Peace First Challenge that mentors and mentees can use and some information about how to get involved. But first, you know, I have to say that we've been working closely with Mentor for quite a few years as one of our key partners. So at Peace First, we truly know the importance of mentors and role, role models for young people and the impact that they make on young people's education, careers, and really their daily lives. We also know that the young people we all work with don't live in vacuums, right? They're constantly on the front lines of the world's problems. Also, most adults tend to think of young people as victims that we need to protect or perpetrators of violence or the future. One day they'll be leaders in the future. And I think that you, know, you and your, your network know that this really isn't true. Like Peace First, you know that young people are really powerful leaders today. And you know that they have the power to make changes in their communities if given the right resources, the right mentors and investments. So Peace First has been working in the peace building field for the last 20 years. We've been working in schools, teaching a, a peacemaking curriculum. About five years ago, we open sourced all of our materials um, and 
that our curriculum is now being used in all 50 states and in 98 countries. You can find that on our website if you're interested. And also we ran something called the Peace First Prize to identify young leaders doing powerful peacemaking work right now. And so from this 20 plus years of experience, we know that young people need supportive adults that believe in them to do this work. So this fall, we're launching a new program called the Peace First Challenge. And, you know, it really came out of a recognition of an incredible opportunity that's happening right now. And I'll mention a few. First, young people really want to do good. This generation of 13 to 18 year olds, their number one issue in the world is peace and justice. And it's more so a higher percentage of them, I think it's around 80% of them, want to make a change in the world. We also know, so any of you, Teenagers know that they're also the most technologically advanced group. So whereas in I may have learned through curriculum, through a textbook, young people now are learning through YouTube videos. They're looking, at, they're looking at social media feeds, and they're looking to their network of peers to learn and expand from. And then lastly, we see that there is potentially a gap in the market um, that we can fill. So there are many organizations that are teaching socio-emotional learning skills, so the grit and integrity that's needed to succeed. There are also many organizations that are teaching uh, community service or service learning with a focus on how much a young person can produce, so how many hours that they're contributing to con community service, et cetera. I think what we've been um, talking about through the Peace First Challenge is really a call to action for young people 13 to 18 around the world to identify an injustice and develop a compassionate solution. And this is really what it looks like is an online platform where a young person will accept the Peace First Challenge and identify as a peacemaker. So they'll have some of that um, personal growth. They'll also create a solution through a project in their community, so involving the community service uh, aspects and they'll get support in the forms of tools, financial investments, like mini grants to get them started, and the Peace First Prize uh, to recognize exemplars of peacemaking. And they'll also have a uh, supportive community to help them along the process. So, you know, I just want to give you a brief overview of what the Peace First Challenge looks like. Um, it's a five-step process where a young person goes through that dual journey of building their socio-emotional learning skills and identifies as a peacemaker and then builds out a project. Through it, they choose an injustice that they care about. And they learn, so in this one, they learn really what the difference is between an injustice and an inconvenience. So for example, it's an inconvenience that a school has a dress code, but it's an injustice that that dress code just applies to girls. They also develop a compassionate insight that comes from speaking to people on opposite sides of the spectrum and coming up with a possible solution grounded in compassion. And this is what I would say we consider as our secret sauce. So an example of this is one of our Peace First Fellows is a young man from Baltimore who was pulled over, um, he was a young man of color, and he was pulled over in Baltimore by the police and basically um, threatened to get beat up. And, you know, from that place of anger, what he did was um, started to interview both police and young people of color and came to the realization that both sides were acting out of fear. The, the police weren't from the same area. The young people didn't know the cops. They were both terrified. And he could have stopped there, but what he wound up doing was creating a project where he trained two-thirds of the Baltimore police force on how to work with young people of color by doing a role play where the, where the young people acted as police and the police acted as young people. From there, um, young people will plan a project. And at this stage, they'll be eligible for small mini grants of under $250 to support their work. Then they'll act and implement their work. And then this is followed by a reflection. And those that will complete their journey will be eligible to apply for the Peace First Prize that recognizes exemplars in peacemaking through grants of $25,000.
So there's a lot of um, stuff going on throughout the way, a lot of tools to support them and um, investments for them to keep on growing. So where we are currently is that we're building the plat this new platform with about 200 young designers. Um, and this fall, we'll have an initial launch, which is really a sneak peek into our work. And it's where young people from our partners' networks are invited to test our resources. And then this spring, there'll be a huge public launch where the challenge is open to everyone. And so Mentor has uh, graciously supported our vision and work because it sees young people as leaders and believes in their power to shift culture. And we're asking you to join us and invite your young people to be peace leaders as well and to support them as they start to explore what it means to be a peacemaker and act with courage and compassion and collaboration, skills that we think and know are important for their work, their daily life, and school. So it's really with your help and that of our other partners and celebrities that we think that we can reach our goal of getting 10,000 young people to sign up for the Peace Search Challenge by this March, which is the end of our initial launch. So um, lastly, and, and Jen, you can kind of move to the last slide if you don't mind, to get um, more information and updates about the Peace First Challenge. You can sign up as a partner at www.peacefirst.org or email me at fjillalboy at peacefirst.org and I can um, ask Jen to send out all my contact information. And we'll also have toolkits that help you share this resource with, your, with mentors in your network. And then I believe Mentor will also be sending out information to your national network this fall. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Farhat. Um, we do have we have two questions that came in. Um, the first says, "It sounds like Peace First really empowers young people to become leaders. How do you see mentoring relationships aligning with this challenge? Do you envision this being a project that matches can work on together, or will mentors be embedded in this initiative?" Wonderful. So mentors, um, it's, it's both. Mentors will be embedded in the process. So it will be mentors supporting young people as they're on this online process. But there's also a really big, important external component to this. So young people who are doing this online are really living this um, out in practice in their communities. And one thing that we know is that young people do need the support of adults in their communities, both for advice, for um, helping to complete a project to make sure that they're staying safe. And so one thing that we will be uh, working on this fall, and maybe be coming out uh, in April for our public launch, is an adult guide to accompany this, um, their journey online. Excellent. And then we have one more question so far. Um, our mentees are on the younger side of your age span, and I'm wondering if an administrator will monitor content put up in the online portal. Yeah, so all the content will be monitored, and the reason why we keep it at age 13 is because of certain laws that require um, that are required for young people to get online and join online platforms. So yes, there will be a lot of safety measures in place on the platform. Okay, great. Well, thank you. It looks like those are the questions for now, but I'll certainly pass along Farhat's um, email address. Maybe I'll just put it right in the slide and share it with you. Um, and thank you so much, Farhat, for joining us. I love this project. I was fortunate enough to go to Peace First Design Day for this challenge, and I was just so impressed with the int intentionality with which you guys planned this and really how, how much youth voice you incorporated. I think probably half the people there were, were young people that you work with. So it's really impressive. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. And with that, we have our final speaker. Let me just pull up these slides. OK. All right, so our final speaker today is Matt. Um, I'd like to introduce Matt from the Thrive Foundation for Youth, 
The Thrive Foundation supports young people during pivotal years in their lives, ages 10 to 18, in reaching their full potential. Thrive believes in the combined power of applied research and on-the-ground practice to make the tangible differences in the lives of young people. Their scientific research is dedicated to answering the question, what helps a young person to thrive? Thrive dedicates their resources to helping disadvantaged young people who may not have adults consistently in their lives or the adults may need help to better support the youth in their care. Their youth serving partners work on the ground with young people throughout the country. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Matt. Uh, thanks, Jen, and, and thanks everybody. This has been super exciting to hear about all these great you know, ideas and progress, and, and uh, so um, hopefully I can continue on for the next uh, 12, 15 minutes and, and uh, share something that will also excite you, and um, we're really looking forward to getting any feedback and thoughts and, and uh, hopefully a, a dialogue that lasts well beyond uh, today's phone call. And uh, as Jen mentioned, my name is Matt Brown. Uh, I'm actually the CEO of a, a group called Alchemy, and we've been working with Thrive for about the last four months on a project that we call the Allies Network. And the Allies Network, we're uh, at a phase in the project where we started to define the concept, and we're looking to start getting some feedback around that before we move into the actual design and development of an app that would enable mentors uh, the YSOs and even the um, youth themselves eventually to um, learn about, build, and leverage social capital. So with that, thank you. So I'm sure everyone on the call is familiar with these um, statistics. Uh, it shows to us um, a really powerful insight and something very helpful to uh, and something we can leverage, which is that I know the, I saw the earliest goals uh, of trying to get, of course, a mentor into every child's life, and that is uh, ambitious, and, and I can't wait to be a part of helping that happen. At the same time, we have millions of mentors in the lives of children, and even more uh, caring adults and natural mentors in their lives. So we have this incredible sort of contact and you know, a body of people who are passionately uh, committed to advancing and helping uh, youth across the country. The question is, um, could we provide them with a tool or set of tools that would help them improve the positive impact they're having? So we're really focused on how do we develop a tool like that and uh, look across the whole spectrum of incremental improvement everywhere. Uh, so with that, the the concept is that we're thinking about, of course, is or the problem. The big problem we're thinking about is um, being disadvantaged. So that is that is the starting point of this work. Albeit, ultimately, it could branch out and encompass all youth. But it, because of Fry's focus on disadvantage, we've really been thinking a, a lot about um, those youth. And what this slide shows is it um, something that may not always be explicitly stated, but it, being disadvantaged is a compound problem. There's no singular issue, right? Um, poverty or um, single parenting or anything like that. There's no single magic bullet that if you solve, you solve for being disadvantaged. But rather, it is a, a constellation of obstacles um, that children face. And children might face, you know, one or or two, or they may face all of these that you see before you. And that directs our thinking around what could be a possible um, uh, solution or tool that could affect um, many of these conditions. Again, no silver bullet, but is there something that's kind of more of a multivitamin approach uh, to uh, addressing being disadvantaged? And that's where we start looking at social capital as a, as a key uh, to this. And as you can reach, read this quote here, this is one quote of literally hundreds and hundreds of uh, data points and, and, and beautiful research that has been done 
that has identified and correlated the value of social capital and essentially the more social capital that you have, it correlates and is causational to overcoming many of these um, elements of being disadvantaged. And then if that's true, like if we know that, that, that that's what the data show us, uh, we also know that the more disadvantaged you are in, in these conditions, the less amount of social capital you have. And so our goal you know, in this project is to develop uh, a tool, a set of tools ultimately that um, accelerates uh, use um, ability to have and build and uh, build and have social capital. So that leads us to uh, the concept that we call active social capital. So Allies Network is the name that we refer to for uh, an app that would um, be available. Um, ultimately, we would hope adopted by all YSOs and enable their mentors and their youth to um, build and use active social capital. And we're making a distinction here between traditional and active um, to um, bring forth some critical elements that uh, often we believe are implicit in social capital, and we want to make sure they're explicit and addressed for, for you. So a bit about traditional, and this is perhaps um, how, how you know, we, we, this is really how I thought of, about coming into the project, which is uh, that really you and your uh, network of, of um, people that you have, that you can draw on to help solve problems or advance opportunities that you're trying to, to achieve. And a great model for that is, is LinkedIn. Uh, which I, um, I hope most, if not all of you, are familiar with. And you know, LinkedIn is this, uh, this great online tool, cloud-based tool, where we can build out a network. I believe mine now is like 600 people or something like that. And it's waiting there. It's waiting there for me to call on it when I need um, to find an employee or, or, or I need to look for a job. And until I call on it, it's really just in the background, it's very passive. So we think there's a different model, uh, and represented here on the on the right hand side of being active. And what we realized is that when you're thinking about social capital, it's not just about the people in your network, and that people can provide you with valuable insight and support, um, but also people are um, giving you access to economic capital, so goods, services, money, experiences that you need. Um, they can also be directing you to information capital, so critical information, skill development, anal analysis and data, and in a way that is meaningful to you. And when we think about active ca social capital, then what we're really thinking about is there's, there's you, like the youth in the center or the mentor in the center, and then you're wrapped around by this um, set of, of relationships, you know, the human capital side, which is then wrapped with information capital, and that is also wrapped with economic capital. And then when you think about how that works, it can work like a traditional model. It's passive, it's waiting for you. But it can also be turned on um, with, for example, a challenge. Let's say that um, a youth, a simple challenge, a youth wants to um, uh, get a, a perfect attendance for the next two weeks in school. Um, all the key people in that youth's life can turn on and provide support, guidance, um, encouragement, and even if there are certain incentives, perhaps there's some economic capital, there's an ice cream uh, at the end of the rainbow here if you do it. And they stay on with the youth throughout that two-week period until the youth has achieved their goals. And there's a, if you are ever interested in looking at an example of this that is being used currently in the athletic world is an app called Edufy, and it's very successful and powerful for coaches and elite athletes. Um, and is the, from what we can tell, perhaps the, 
the best example currently of the, the idea of active social capital. And there's another way to just view active social capital, which is uh, represented here, where you see that there's you in the center, and then the three different um, kind of ecosystems all interconnecting. So you can see that sometimes you need access to all three simultaneously, but perhaps you just need economic capital. You need a resource right now, and you want to get that, and you can um, you can uh, ideally get that swiftly without having to um, have the uh, any time delay of going to a person first to get the actual resource that you need. Now, here's where we kind of step back and say, okay, what we've shared so far is really kind of the concept of active social capital, and now how might we apply that um, into uh, the YSO community to really support mentors and youth? And this is where we um, we are starting to build around the concept of the Allies Network. And what you're seeing here is a visual representation of where our focus is always on that center, right? like how do we really help mentors and youth? And the, the ecosystem then builds out with the YSOs. And so we have all these beautiful organizations, which many are represented here on this call. And you have different groups of people inside your YSO, and some that are um, bridges, for like the alumni. And then outside of the YSO, there are other like large systems, like hopefully our youth is in school, right, and they have access to health care, but they may not. Or some, we you know, have some uh, interaction with foster care or with juvenile justice. So, so we want to be able to connect those systems into the um, allies network. And then there's all other types of, of adults, caring adults that have um, uh, impact potentially on uh, our youth natural mentors, their teachers, their coaches, their religious leaders, um, other mentors from other YSOs, so peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support from mentors to mentors where they can share best practices or, or help problem solve together with something that's new that they've run across. Um, of course, we want the, the family uh, involved. Uh, and then I'll talk on the next slide in a moment about um, caring adult experts, or, um, but we'll get to that in a moment. So those are, all those are kind of the um, human capital part, everything again you see in blue, but also then you see that it is connected, the Allies Network incorporates um, economic capital, which could be provided from national resources all the way down to, um, to the YSO itself and, and the resources it wants to um, populate into the, to the um, app. Similarly with information capital, and in this, we're really thinking a lot about curated content and ensuring that the best in class, the best in breed um, content, skill, uh, skill development, videos, those types of things are um, included. And they can, again, be provided by the YSO. Um, Thrive has done a lot of support and research in this area, so certainly they would um, provide all that uh, content or other sources of best in class. So the next slide is a quick step back from uh, from that little bubble of caring adults, but how might we think about um, uh, expanding access for youth? Right? This would be a way of having immediate social capital in in the relationships. And you know, I've in the research we've done, we've heard lots of stories about um, youth finding their sparks. I mean, uh, youth might want to be a graphic designer or a musician or they want to be a doctor or they, whatever they are starting to dream about becoming. Um, the app could have a network of different types of groups of people from LinkedIn to, um, to uh, Major League Baseball that the student, the youth, or the mentors can reach out to to get um, uh, guidance, um, job interviews, support, yeah, uh, insights, uh, guidance um, around uh, their their spark. All right, and uh, that's the core of it. And I, I want to be. I'm looking up at the, the clock, so I know we have uh, limited time. I want to um, touch on a, a couple of slides here quickly, just to give you a little more detail. Um, so this is how the the concept could be, um, so the, the pond could be stocked with these ecosystems of people. 
and resources and uh, information, then what can mentors uh, do? Um, what could the app enable? So an app can enable, as I mentioned, peer-to-peer -peer problem solving. Right? Um, it can enable quick, rapid access to vital information that would be helpful from positive, like how to write a resume or how to um, write an effective email to um, dealing with crisis. Um, if children are being bullied or there's um, drug abuse in their community, like how could they handle that? Um, similarly, rapid access to uh, the resources that, that uh, our mentors and our youth need. Um, personal growth via challenges, uh, ways in which uh, the mentor and the youth can set up a goal and then the um, network around that youth can help the child achieve that goal. Uh, broadcasting useful information inside and throughout the YSO. Um, alerts among key adults to um, ensure that there's fast intervention. Um, notices and reminders um, to help with um, personal management and growth. And all of these functionalities, as you can see, is as many currently are done in disparate ways, and we think that that would be much more powerful if they were integrated into one solution. Um, uh, both efficacy, so helping mentors be more effective, and for efficiency, right? So that they can spend more time with their youth, helping their youth, and less time trying to use the internet or other tools to find resources or information that's difficult to find. We want to have it all aggregated in a single location and easy to access. Um, I, uh, I'm going to um, go on to the next couple slides quickly. I'm sure you've probably read the other benefits to the YSOs, the youth, and to um, the caring adults. Um, what these show, the next few, are different types of ways in which the app could be used. These are conceptual, obviously, um, with the arrows. But in this one, what, what these arrows represent is how to um, mentor could set up a weekly challenge, as I mentioned before, kind of the perfect attendance, and who would be involved, and um, the information flowing around until the challenge is accomplished. On the next one would be getting crisis help. So if a youth is in crisis, she could um, access the app to find um, information and content that could potentially uh, help her. If that is insufficient, then uh, the app would provide her uh, quickly to get a resource. Um, maybe it's a, a call center hotline, for example, and then alerts will go out to um, to a mentor or to a parent or whoever's been authorized to get a uh, an alert, uh, so that an intervention can start to happen immediately. On uh, the next example. We have um, resources. Uh, so in this case, um, this is a scenario where um, youth has uh, lives in a cold climate, needs uh, winter clothes. Turns out many youth in the YSO need it, and um, requests can go out to alumni, donors, the board, as well as to third-party resources providers to secure uh, the needed clothing for all the youth in the organization. And it's readily and immediately accessible. Uh, another scenario, uh, classic, we've heard, I've heard a lot in research is um, how to get a job or volunteer for a job or get an internship. And uh, this model shows how we would integrate um, content, for example, how to write a resume with resources, access to caring adults in the community who could give you a shadow or give you an initial interview. Um, as well as connecting in with um, alumni that similarly could advise and support the youth in trying to find their first job. And I'll stop there so that there might be a moment or two for any Q&A. But thank you again so much for um, letting me share the Allies Network con concept with everybody. And uh, looking forward to um, any thoughts, builds, how to improve, and uh, hopefully a dialogue after this, and uh, Jen, uh, I would love to have my uh, my and Dana's email uh, shared uh, with everyone after this, if possible. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for presenting that, Matt. Um, it sounds really exciting, and I'm, I can't wait to see where this goes.
We do have a couple of questions for you. Um, someone asked, do you envision this being an enhancement to a program, something that a program administrator from the program would uh, oversee? Or is this something that can work independent of a program? Um, I, it is flexible enough to that's the, the short end. It can certainly be independent um, when we think about, um, uh, for example, the information capital and content being provided by the YSO. We thought about how program goals um, and desired outcomes and maybe even, you know, dripping all the way down to value statements that the YSO could integrate that in uh, to uh, the app itself for the customized version that works for best for their group. So you have the option of of uh, customizing it or um, using kind of out of the box. Great. Um, another question: What is the process for testing use of the network? Is there going to be a rollout? Will there be opportunities for you serving organizations to test it? Yes. Uh, the the product development process will um, start the project in, in the design development in one of um, Thrive's um, grantees, um, most likely Friends of the Children, um, and then to like three to five of the Thrive's, and then ultimately to all 15. And then once we've um, got any of the kinks out of the system, uh, then we would be uh, looking to expand um, ultimately to, if we could, every YSO in the country. So yeah, there is an incremental development process. If there are groups who are interested in being a part of the early stage um, testing, uh, please let me know because I could certainly, uh, it's certainly possible and we'd be interested in including people outside of the Thrive grantee network. Okay, great. Two more questions here. Um, have you spoken with LinkedIn at all about syncing their network of people into this app? Um, uh, have not spoken um, at the very top of the list. It's <laughs> a great idea. Uh, so when we're prepared to have the conversations um, around connecting the caring adult experts in, uh, LinkedIn is the very top of the list. And I have initiated the relationship. Um, so I have as well as Dana. So we, um, I believe we have the right people to talk to. Um, and I would like to get the design and development just um, a little further along so it looks a little more concrete to them before we, we have that conversation. Okay. And so the last question, a lot of questions for you. People are excited about this. Um, is it, will this be customizable for each program? It, would it be easy to change with different functions? Yeah, that is, that, the, the short answer is yes. It is intended to be, um, it's intended to be customizable in a couple of ways. Um, one is that there may be some um, visual design, like putting your brand or color palette in there. So that's a kind of superficial way. Two is that um, each YSO would have the authority to control which of those ecosystems is turned on or turned off. So maybe you don't want, um, um, you know, whatever uh, the general justice system ecosystem to be turned on. So you have control over that as well as permissions for who has any particular type of authority to interact or not interact with the mentor and, and youth. Um, then, and then, as we said earlier, around the program. Uh, it is completely uh, flexible about integrating the, the goals and the content of any YSO into the um, app itself. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I'd love for you to, Matt, keep us updated as this goes along, and I'd be happy to share um, new information and, and new stages as, as you progress. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Okay, well thank you everyone for joining us. I think we're one minute over, which is probably the closest to 4.15 we've ever gotten. Um, so thank you everyone for joining, and I will be sure to follow up tonight with
some of the links that Liz Hardy discussed, the PowerPoint slides with contact information, um, and the Mentoring Connector Toolkit. So our next call will be Wednesday, November 2nd at 3 p.m., um, and we look forward to speaking with you then. Have a great afternoon, everyone.